Hi, everybody. I got a true crime story for you today. This one was a cold case for 45 years before police were finally able to solve this. Hello, welcome back to the channel. This is Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, also known as Crafting Journey. These are some of my crafts, including Legos, crochet, crochet, cross stitch. Yeah, you name it, and I'll try it. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the story of a young 11-year-old girl named Linda O'Keefe. She lived in Newport Beach, California. She was born on May 24th, 1962. Only two years younger than me. So I can relate to this story. So um, her parents were Barbara and Richard O'Keefe and her sisters were Linda and Diana. I'm sorry, Cindy and Diana. Cindy was older by seven years and Diana was younger by two years. So Cindy was like 18 when all this went down, already graduated working. So Linda at the time, this, she was attending summer school. This is in July. She's attending summer school and uh, it, it gets out about one o'clock. It's not all day long. And that day she usually rides her bicycle. Um, but that particular day, her piano teacher gave her a ride to school. So when school was over, she called mom and she, I don't want to walk home. Can you, can you come give me a ride? And mom's like, no, just walk home. A uh, decision or, uh, that she will come to regret, unfortunately. So on July 6, 1973, she's walking home. That evening when... Um, mom and dad get home they're thinking she wasn't there she's like oh they're she's at her friend's house which back in those days you know we just we played out in the street you know your parents put you out the door and said come back at dinner time you know they didn't care what you did <laughs> go eat sand um seriously and it, um if you were if your parents worked you were known as a latchkey kid you let yourself in the door you got a snack you watched some tv you know, and then you went and played with your friends. So she wasn't there. But uh, when she doesn't come home by dinner time, they're getting worried. So they go out and they start looking for her, calling around. They're now finding her. So they go back home and they call 911. Yeah. So a search ensues. And the following morning, there are a father and a son out walking uh, in this area called Back Bay. Uh, and they were looking for frogs. And they find in a ditch the body of Linda O'Keefe, 11 years old. So friends describe Linda as shy, sweet, um, quiet, a gentle soul. She liked Girl Scouts. She liked to read. She liked to listen to music. She was a nature lover. Um, yeah. So the autopsy was performed and the cause of death was strangulation and she had been sexually assaulted. So they had the forethought. This is back in early 70s. DNA was not a big deal then. Like, not at all. <laughs> not even on anybody's radar, but they... Uh, swabbed some semen that was on her dress that her mom had her mom was a seamstress and uh, had sewn her this cute little blue and white dress that she had on that day so on this dress they were able to swab the semen and they saved it for 40 some years now shortly after the murder and during their investigation uh, a guy go a guy I can't talk today a guy comes forward and he said that he did it. He confesses. Well, this turned out to be a classmate of the older sister, uh, Cindy. And she's like, eh, strange guy. But um, turns out he was just doing it for notoriety. He did not do it. He did not know. And there was, there's information that police always hold back that only a murder, murderer would know. But he didn't know this information. So it wasn't him. So the case goes cold 
they don't, they're not finding anyone. Meanwhile, in this 45 years that pass, Barbara and uh, Richard, they pass away without ever knowing who killed their daughter, Linda. And the family dynamics changed a lot after this. You know, they, they used to go camping and um, all kinds of activities. And after that, they, they weren't interested anymore. Not to mention it changed the whole neighborhood. Like these, her classmates and kids that used to ride their bikes to school, they are now getting rides to school. Yeah, it's, it's haunting. So they, um, they find a witness, a couple of witnesses, a mom and her daughter who had seen Linda. Now she left school around one. They saw Linda between one and two within the, within an hour of her calling her mom. And she was on the corner of Marguerite Avenue and Inlet Drive, about a mile from her home. And she was talking to a guy um, in a turquoise van. Now, the witnesses described the guy as having, he's being a white male, curly hair, and um, late 20s, early 30s. And he had his door partially ajar. They did not get the tag number of the vehicle. They tried through hypnosis to see if they could get the tag number, and it just did not pan out. So after they discovered the body, uh, another witness came forward that lived up on a bluff above the ditch where this the body was found. And she came forward and said that she had heard, during the relevant time period, she had heard a female voice saying, stop, you're hurting me. But did not have the foresight to call 911. That one I don't get. I, I don't understand why you would not call 911. And that's very unfortunate. So they saved these DNA swabs for years and years and years. So in the early 90s, when DNA starts to be used more and more, they, they, they get out this swab and they develop a profile single source, male, unidentified. So they run it through the CODIS database. And that, and that database is anybody that's ever been arrested. They're in that, their DNA. As soon as you're convicted, they take your DNA and they put you in this CODIS thing. So um, your fingerprints and your DNA. No match, nobody in the CODIS. So, um, so it gets put back on the shelf. Then in 2018, uh, there was a killer identified out in California. I don't know if you remember the Golden State Killer. Um, he was identified through genetic genealogy. And it's done through these labs that can develop, the, they can take the profile that you have and develop branches, you know, they can piece together the family tree and figure out who's, I don't know how it's done, but it's amazing. That's how they caught the Golden State Killer, who pled guilty this year to many, many counts. He's very, very old. He'll probably die in jail. But he, he did not have a trial. He pled guilty. So he's spending the rest of his life in prison. Um, in any case, uh, they, they go to this Parabon Nano Labs, and uh, they work with this one woman, and she helps him try to develop this family tree. But nothing is giving them a suspect. Nothing's giving, Nothing's panning out. So they get a call, the police get a call one day from a company called Family Tree. And they said, I think we have your guy. Um, and they're like, oh, a relative? And they're like, no, your guy. <laughs> we have a match. So because they had pulled, put the DNA into multiple databases. So they find this guy named James Allen Neal. He's living in Monument, Colorado, and is 72 years old. So they're like, how can we put this guy in Newport Beach, California, at the time of the murder? So what they did was, um, in, and this guy's just living his life in Monument, Colorado. He's a father. He's a grandfather. Um, his real name, though, was James Albert Layton. So apparently shortly after the time frame where the murders were, he moved to Florida and changed his name. So they found out that during the relevant time frame of the murder, 
he was living in California, about 30 miles away from where Linda lived. So they look up his criminal record and it is a doozy. <laughs> he has got multiple counts of burglary going back to 1959. The first was August of 1959 when he spent 40, he was sentenced to 40 days in jail and probation for his first burglary. Then a few months later in October of that same year, he has a second burglary charge. And for that, he was sentenced to the California Youth Authority. I don't know what that is, but I guess juvenile detention center of some sort. So from there, he gets paroled and he commits another burglary in September of 1964 and spends nine months in jail for that. Then in September of 1965, he commits another burglary, um, which was reduced to petty theft and then dismissed altogether. Then in 1966, he's working at this gas station and his wife, she's home pregnant and he decides he's gonna steal gas from the gas station. So he gets charged with that. He's sentenced to a work project. All of this is before the murder of Linda. Sentenced to a work project that he escapes from in 1967. Uh, when he's recaptured, they sentence, he's sentenced to three to 10 years in the Department of Corrections in Denver, Colorado. So at the time of the murder, he was on parole in, from Colorado, but had moved to California. Yeah, interesting, interesting guy. Yeah. So the police, they get on their, they get on a plane, they go to Colorado, and they follow this guy around because they need to get a DNA sample from him. And he keeps taking, he's smoking a cigarette, and then he takes the, the butt of it, puts it out, and puts it in his pocket. And they thought, well, that's just a weird habit. Come to find out the laws in the state of Colorado are very, very heavily, um, like you'll get a fine if you get caught, a very stiff fine if you get caught tossing a cigarette out. Probably to prevent fires, wildfires, fires, I would, I would assume. In any case, um, he was walking through a supermarket parking lot one day and he puts a, he throws a cigarette out. They get it, they get his DNA, they find it, you know, lo and behold, this, this is the match. This is the guy who left his semen sample on Linda's dress back in 1973. So he is arrested and extradited back to California. And now he's 73 years old by the time he gets back there. And what the police also do is they decide that they're going to post a story through a, a series of posts uh, on Twitter. Now, Twi when she died, Twitter was 44 years away. <laughs> like Twitter came 44 years later, but it helped get tips to solve her murder. Um, this story, it was told in her own voice. In other words, she was talking. Here is a 48 hours episode, if you want to see that, where you can hear the story as read by the person who wrote it um, about how she, you know, didn't want to walk home that day. She was tired. Um, you know, she got into this guy's van. It, yeah, just a sad, sad story. And they got a lot of leads from that story. So, Um, going back through the pleadings, the court pleadings, um, there was one comment by um, in the pleadings that mentioned that Mr. Layton was emotionally immature and psychologically unstable. He didn't complete school. He um, couldn't maintain a job. He, he didn't really get along well with friends and colleagues, um, just couldn't relate to them. So... Then they found after his criminal record after the murder from July 1995 through July 2000, five year period of time, lewd and lascivious acts on a minor, a, a, a young girl under the age of 14. And then another uh, incident between 2002 and 2004, different female, lewd and lascivious acts on a female, 
under the age of 14 on a child. Um, now, a, he was charged with way more. There was He had a history of violence, a history of sexual assault um, on young girls. He preyed on girls between 7 and 13 years of age. And a lot of it, um, they could, because at the time of the murder of Linda, the penalty for that murder would have only been seven years to life. They wanted to get a little bit, they wanted to make the case a little meatier. Um, so because uh, this Twitter story had like 7 million hits, they got, it, it allowed them to get a warrant from the judge to search James's computer, the suspect, to see if he was following the Twitter story which I don't know if he was or not, but what they found on that computer was tons of child pornography. So they add on the child pornography charges and they add on the two sexual assault charges that the, the ones that I described because they were not outside the statute of limitations because a lot of things that he did were outside of the statute of limitations. But they wanted the jury to know about these. Unfortunately, um, in late May of... 2020, James is transferred to the hospital where he passes away from COVID-19. So we never saw a trial, which I guess gives family closure in one respect, but not fully. In any case, here's some clips of this man, James, during the police interview, just some snippets of him denying, you know, like vehemently denying that he had murdered this girl. Do you remember this girl, Jim? No, sir. Have you ever seen her before? No. She looks, she's like almost like one of my kids' pictures, but. But you don't remember this little girl? You don't remember picking this girl up on the side of the road? I've never picked up any kids, ever. You've had 45 years to convince yourself that you did not do this. It's time to take responsibility for what you did to this little girl. I didn't, I don't need to be responsible for something I didn't do. Single source, male. Guess who's? Yours. This is 100% match. I can't, I can't explain. So you're telling me just miraculously your semen got on her? It must be miraculous because it wasn't me. Sad, sad case. So that's the story for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, hopefully there'll be a trial to cover tomorrow. I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye.